Hello, I'm Julia Banning, a volunteer here at the Banning Museum, and I welcome you all to the virtual Banning Heritage Field Trip. Today, we're going to see about life here at the house for the Banning family over 150 years ago. We will start with a tour of the house, have a lesson in a one-room schoolhouse, participate in some daily chores that children were responsible for in that time, see a demonstration of a craft called decoupage, which was very popular in that day, the Victorian era of the 19th century. We will also see a fascinating demonstration of blacksmith. Blacksmith did many things very important to keeping a household running, including shoeing horses, horses and mules that were responsible for transportation in that day. So I hope you're interested in all these fascinatingly different lifestyles and that it inspires you to learn more about the history of Wilmington and Southern California in your school days. Thank you. Welcome to the Banning Museum, the home of Phineas Banning. The room that you're in right now is the front parlor. It's the most formal room of the house. If you were actually visiting when the Banning family lived here, children would probably be sent outside to play with the Banning children, and teachers and parents would come into this room to visit with the family. As you look around this room, it's just filled with beautiful items, furniture, statues, paintings. All of these items in this room were meant to impress, uh, to show people that the family uh, had good taste and that they could for afford such things. On the far wall over here, you will see portraits of Phineas Banning and Mrs. Banning when they were younger. And over here, you see a wonderful grand piano. In those days, people provided their own entertainment. Oftentimes, they would have parties here. In fact, they were famous for their parties, regales as they were called. And often, someone would be playing the piano, and there would be dancing in the hallway. Now, I said that usually children were not invited in this room. It was mostly for company and guests, but there certainly were exceptions. When the family had company, oftentimes children were brought into the room to meet the guests. And when they came in, children would curtsy or they would bow. And oftentimes they would do something entertaining for the company, such as recite a poem that they had memorized, or maybe read a verse, play a musical instrument, maybe even tell a riddle. If you were invited into the parlor, what would you do? The room that I'm in right now is Phineas Banning's office. Phineas Banning was in the business of transportation. The name of his company was Banning and Company. Banning and Company started out running freight wagons and stagecoaches from here at the Banning Ranch down to the harbor to pick up passengers that came in on the ships. The stagecoaches would pick up the passengers, the freight wagons would pick up the cargo, and they would head into the Pueblo, into Los Angeles, and then back again. So this was a very, very busy place. After the Civil War, Phineas Banning was elected to the state senate. His main goal as a state senator was to bring the first railroad to Southern California. And that became a reality in 1869. The Los Angeles and San Pedro Railroad began business. The San Pedro and Los Angeles Railroad ran between Wilmington and downtown Los Angeles. Also, as a state senator, Phineas Banning signed the 13th Amendment to abolish slavery. 
and you can see his signature here right at the tip of my fan right under senator there he is phineas banning do you know what i mean when i say the word abolish now let's look around uh, phineas banning's office over here let's look at his desk how would you compare this to an office in today's world? Let's see what he has here. Okay, a canteen with some water, an inkwell, and fountain pens over here. Oh, some eyeglasses, a stamp pad, and some miscellaneous papers here. All of those are things that would have been used in offices in those days. Uh, but thinking about today's offices, what inventions are missing? This is safe in his office. There were no banks in Los Angeles until the late 1860s. So this was something that was very necessary for businesses of that time. Uh, this is where they would keep their valuables uh, and very important papers. I don't know if you noticed this when you first saw into the room. This is Phineas Banning's copy press. Now, most of the documents in those days were handwritten. And when he needed a copy to give to someone on maybe a contract that they had signed, this is what he would use, the copy press. So in order to use the copy press, you would take the original handwritten paper of the contract you put in a blank piece of paper, put a solution in here, and turn the press to make a copy. Now the first copy that came out would be a mirror image. So immediately you would take out the original copy, put in the mirror image copy, another blank piece of paper, and you had to do this quickly before the solution would dry, turn the press, and out came the copy that you needed. So a lot of work just for one copy. So the room that we're in right now is called the family living room. Sometimes it's called the back parlor. It's very different from the front parlor. The back parlor or this family living room, this is where the family gathered. And you have to think about it back in those times. This was before electricity. There was no electricity in this home. Uh, throughout the home, uh, you've probably noticed that there's candles. There were uh, oil burning lamps. Uh, the lighting fixtures were gas lighting fixtures. So when the family gathered in the evening, they didn't have iPads, they didn't have their laptops, they didn't have iPhones or video games, nothing like that. What they did are some of the things that you see here. The family often read together. They would take turns reading. You can see all of these books here. They played parlor games. Children were encouraged to learn to play musical instruments and they would practice in here. There's a stereoscope over there that they played with. You can see over here there is collections. Collecting was also very popular. Over here we can see on display a, a butterfly collection. I notice over here there's an ostrich egg. The ostrich farm was a very popular destination back in those days. Here's another collection over here of seashells. And did you happen to notice this chair? Quite unusual looking, but remember Los Angeles is once was referred to as a cow town. This was really the Wild West. And this chair is made of cow hide and cow horns. I wonder how many cow horns are on this chair. This is the master bedchamber. This is the parents' bedroom. When Phineas Banning was 24 years old, he married Rebecca Sanford. She was 19. They were married for 14 years, and during those 14 years, they had nine children. Now, there's a sad part of that story as well. Of those nine children, only three survived. Three boys named William, Joseph, and Hancock. 
Now, this was a long time ago. In those days, they did not have the medicines that we now have. They had epidemics like the smallpox epidemics. They didn't have immunizations. They didn't know as much about germs in those days. In those days, children were born right at home in their parents' bed. It was thought to be safer than to go to a hospital. And also there would have been no hospital or doctor nearby. If there was an illness or an accident, uh, the doctor would come out to the home, but it might, there might be considerable travel involved. Now, uh, the first Mrs. Banning, Rebecca, also died shortly after the birth of their ninth child. Two years later, Phineas Banning remarried. He married Mary Hollister from Hollister, California, and they had three children. And of those three children, two survived, this time girls, two girls, their names were Mary and Lucy. Okay, we've kind of talked about uh, when the Bannings were living here, there was, of course, no electricity. Uh, the only heat source would have been fireplaces, and you've probably noticed fireplaces in all of the rooms. And there was no indoor plumbing. What that means is no running water in the house. So that you could not go to the sink and turn on the faucets and wa wash your hands or wash your face. All of the bedrooms would have pitchers and basins like this. This one's very fancy, made of silver. Every day, someone would have to go out and pump water outside. The pitchers would be filled with water and be carried up the steps and brought into the bedrooms. And when you needed to wash, you would pour the water into the basin. That is where you would wash your hands, wash your face, and brush your teeth. Down on the floor here is a foot bath. You could stand in the foot bath to wash and also, of course, wash your feet in the foot bath. Uh, speaking of washing up, uh, typically people only took baths once a week because it was a lot of work. It would have been a metal tub. It would have been downstairs because there would have been a lot of water that would have to be pumped outside. The bathtub would have to be filled with the water. It would have to be heated first on the stove. So only once a week for a bath. So no indoor plumbing also means no flush toilet in the house. In the daytime, people would go outside to an outhouse that was just a small wooden shack away from the house a bit that had a hole in the ground and that's where they would go to the bathroom in the daytime. At nighttime, all of the bedrooms have chamber pots and they're usually hidden. This one is quite uh, fancy. This chamber pot in this room is hidden in the steps that go up to the bed. I'll show you. There would be a porcelain pot in here, and that's where you would go to the bathroom at nighttime instead of having to go outside to the outhouse. Now, the Bannings were lucky. They had uh, staff here, uh, servants to help them with the chores, like cleaning the chamber pot. Some families did not have those luxuries, and oftentimes it was the children's chore to clean the chamber pot. This is the girls' room. It's dedicated to the two girls, Lucy and Mary. Growing up here on the Banning Ranch when Mary and Lucy were little, they played outdoors and did many of the outdoor things that boys did. But when children became teenagers, for girls, that's when their life became more of an indoor life. And girls were expected to learn certain things, like learning to sew, learning to run a household, those types of things. Usually girls in those days did not have as much formal education as boys because there were very few jobs for women. Two jobs that I can think of are a nurse or a teacher. But most girls in those days, it was their goal when they grew up to get married. And so it was with the two Banning girls. Now, uh, part of a girl's education in those days was learning to sew. 
All girls learn to sew as part of their education. Also, boys and girls also learned social skills. And by social skills, I mean things like learning about music and learning to dance and things of that nature. In those days, uh, girls always changed clothing be behind a changing or a dressing screen. And that's what this is, a beautifully decorated changing screen. So even if no one else were in the room, the girls would go behind here to change their clothing. And this changing screen is really quite beautiful. In those days, it was people often save things and repurpose them. And in this changing screen, these beautiful pictures that were saved by someone were decoupaged onto this screen. So people would save pictures that they liked from magazines or uh, maybe from wrapping paper or greeting cards. They would save all of these things and do a project. Something like this must have taken a long time, but it's really quite beautiful. This is actually a photograph of Lucy when she was a teenager. She was a princess in the parade called the Fiesta de las Flores that was an early parade in Los Angeles prior to the Rose Parade. Okay, so we are in the boys' room now. This room is dedicated to the three boys, William, Joseph, and Hancock. And as we look around this room, there are all sorts of hints about what activities the Banning children and children of that time like to do in their spare time. One of the things I see over here on the bookshelf are the books, and reading was very popular. One of the most popular subjects was reading about the Wild West. Up here we have deer antlers that are used to make a hat rack. Remember, this was a remote area. There would have been deer in the area. Deer shed their antlers, but also they would have hunted in those days. On this hat rack, it starts out with a a one-point antler, so this would be from quite a young deer, maybe no more than three years old. And it goes over here to a six-point antler over here, so that would have been from a, quite a large deer, a royal stag. In the corner, we have a desk. And of course, studies were very important. There's a book here, a little reader from school, a stereoscope again. We saw one of those downstairs. And right on top is an abacus. That would have helped them with their math problems. Over here, there is a Civil War sword up here. And remember, this house was built in 1864 during the Civil War, and there would have been Union soldiers right down the street. Another popular item in those days, are any of you into physical fitness? Well, the Bannings were, and that's what we have here. These are weights that would be filled with sand, and you could do your exercise, get your exercise uh, with the weights. Over here, Another example of repurposing. Remember I said the girls would sew? And what we have here are the wooden spools that the thread came on. Someone put them together and made uh, a little uh, shelf here. Okay, more clues about what the Banning children like to do in their spare time. Look at this, it's a telescope. Can you imagine? There would have been no street lights back in those days, so no light pollution. They would have been able to see the stars very clearly, the planets. That would have been a very popular thing to do. This looks like a toy boat up here. Many toys in those days were homemade. They would save scraps of wood and work on them for a good time. Uh, does anyone like to listen to music? In those days, they listened to music on their graphophone. You put a wax cylinder on, you turn the crank, and the sound came out here. Um, a kite, many homemade toys in those days. Kite flying was very popular. Did you happen to notice the bicycle over here? Look at how high up that bicycle is. 
It would have been a very, quite a dangerous ride to say the least. There were no handbrakes. It would, uh, in order to put on the brakes, it would kind of be like a tricycle. You would put one uh, foot back to go on the brakes. And fishing poles, fishing was very popular. Over here, we have a canteen. Just think of it. Of course, here on the ranch, the children would have all learned to ride horses. And can you imagine going on your horse with a canteen? Maybe you're taking your fishing tackle and a fishing pole along. And definitely some binoculars. Those are really nice ones in the center. There's also a bag of marbles there. That was another very popular game of the time. Welcome to Leisure Time Activities. Leisure time is anything you get to do in your fun, free spare time. It does not include chores and homework, which is something you have to do. This is more about enjoyment. So leisure time back then was really hands-on. It was craft activities, reading, it was going outside and playing, uh, different than some of the more modern leisure time activities we have today, uh, watching television, listening to music on your phone, uh, going to the mall and to the video game arcade. Uh, so very different kind of leisure time activities, but still leisure activities. If you have seen the tour, there's actually uh, one of the rooms, it's the girls room, and they have a changing screen and it looks something like this, except much, much bigger. And if you look carefully at it, you'll see that there are images on there that look like they've almost been cut out. And what that's called is decoupage. And that was a very, very common activity that they did back then for leisure. Decoupage uh, comes from the French word meaning to cut. It's decoupé. And it's like a cutout because you are literally taking pictures and cutting them out. Another example of decoupage would be this fan. It looks like it's been completely covered, but this takes a lot of time and effort. You would actually take images and create almost like a scrapbook that you could later come back to and you would remove those images to put them on things such as the changing screen. This is an example of that. These are images that were taken uh, from magazines, newspapers that they liked and you would cut them out, paste them in here and save them to use for a later time. And if you go through the book, some of the images you'll see have already been cut out, such as here. And that means they've already been used for decoupage purposes. And now we're going to be doing decoupage and what we need in terms of supply and this all varies depending on what you have available at your house but we're going to be making a bookmark and you'll need a pair of scissors just any kind of paper or if you already have it just a blank bookmark that you could use you'll need a hole puncher some glue some ribbon or string, markers, stickers or newspapers and magazines, uh, pictures that you have that you want to use. Um, you're just going to be cutting them out. So it's going to be the same process. So what you'll want to do, take your pair of scissors and start by cutting out your bookmark. And I'm just going to make a regular size bookmark but you can make any kind of bookmark you want. It could be a circle, it could be a star, it can be a heart, it can be whatever you want it to be. So you're just gonna take it, cut your bookmark, and you know, you're just gonna take the paper, take the hole punch, and create a little hole where you could take your string that's gonna basically be the placeholder outside of the book. It doesn't have to be too long. Um, you could do this in different ways, but the way I like to do it is I just take it, take both ends and put them together and get both of them to go through the hole and pull them out, not too far, because then you're going to take the loop end and take both of those ends and pull them through. And that's going to get you um, the bookmark that you're going to see on the outside of the book. So 
now that you have your basic bookmark, there's different things you can do. So if you want to take something you've cut, um, you know, and just kind of glue it on there, that's fine. So then, you know, just look like this. Or if you want to draw some designs on there, that's fine as well. I'm drawing a heart and a little star at the bottom. So that just looks something like that. Um, but if you want to cut something else out, you can take a magazine or a brochure or any image you want and just cut it out. And it doesn't have to be cut perfectly because you're just going to be adding on top of these um, as you continue on making your bookmark. So now that I've taken my image, I'm going to add some more glue to this and just put that at the bottom of my bookmark. So you'll see that you can, it goes over the edges, but that's okay. We're gonna go over that and cover that in a second. And you're free to do this however you want. I'm gonna take some stickers now and just kind of put them on top of my bookmark. And I'm gonna take rows and just kind of put it right here. And then what I wanna do is Fold the edge over so that it covers the other side of the bookmark. And that's okay. Um, you might have some white space showing in the front. Uh, that's also fine. There's no right or wrong answer to this. It's, you know, however you want to do this. And this is what it looks like in the front. And you just kind of keep going and you keep rolling it until all of the edges are completely taken care of. So this is here an in progress bookmark. But when you're completely done, it will look something like this. So it's just completely covered um, and you can just see that there's some of it's coming off of the edges, but then you just take it and you fold it back and you're done. That's decoupage. Welcome to our one room schoolhouse. Come on in. In the 1880s, school was in one room. That means there was one teacher who taught all the grade levels, first through sixth grade, sometimes to the eighth grade. Imagine, you'd be in school with your brother or sister or maybe a cousin. Here's a picture of a one-room schoolhouse in the 1880s. This is in the San Fernando Valley. The teachers had a big job. They had to prepare lessons for all their students at all the different grade levels, and they also had to keep the classroom clean. So every morning they would come in and they would sweep the floor, gather up the firewood, put it in the fireplace, because they wanted to make sure the classroom was nice and warm for the students, especially on cold winter mornings like we have today. The teacher would also, every morning, go to the well, fill up her bucket with water, and have water for the children to drink if they were thirsty. Here you go. Here's one for you. Here's one for you. <gasps> What's wrong with what I'm doing? If you're saying germs, you're absolutely right, germs. But in the 1880s, they didn't know about germs. So if one student came in with a hacking cough and drank out of the ladle, and then another student drank from out of the same ladle, what do you think will happen? Probably would get sick, right? There was no vaccinations for childhood diseases like measles, mumps, and chicken pox. So many children got very sick when they were young, and many children also died. Now teachers had a lot of rules. One of the rules was the way they dressed. Women teachers had to wear long skirts with long sleeves and high collars. The men teachers, they had to wear a suit with a starched collar and tie. Also, women teachers in the 1880s, once they got married, they weren't allowed to teach anymore. They had to give up their profession and stay home to take care of their family. Whereas a man teacher, they were allowed to continue teaching because they had to support their family. You can see I dress differently than your teachers do today, right? Also, students dress differently in those days. 
Boys wore short pants, long sleeve shirts with no collars. They wore a collar, a detachable collar that you could put on and take off. Remember in those days, they didn't have washing machines. So it was much easier to wash the collar, hang it up to dry and have it ready for the following day. Boys also wore hand-me-downs. Hand-me-downs are clothes that are passed down to you or you pass down to someone else. Suspenders are worn to hold up their pants. They buckled in the front, they buckled in the back. Suspenders are very important, especially if those hand-me-downs you were wearing were too big for you. This would hold up your pants. Now, girls wore dresses. They didn't wear pants, they didn't wear shorts, they didn't wear leggings. They wore dresses and some, they had usually three dresses. One dress that they wore every day to school, a dress for church, and if they were lucky, they had a dress for a party. So when they came to school, all the girls wore an apron or a pinafore over their dress. That was a way to keep their dress clean because it was a lot easier to wash the apron, hang it up and have it ready for the following day rather than have to wash the whole, whole dress. Remember, there was no washing machines. Everything was done by hand. Now, let's see what students learned in the 1800s. You're going to notice that some of the things that they studied are some of the things that you study now. They had reading, arithmetic, arithmetic is a different word for math, penmanship, history, science, and elocution. Let's talk about reading. For reading, they used a McGuffey reader, and this is for fourth grade. And this book is full with stories and poems. And in those days, for their reading lesson, they would read aloud. So they would the whole class would read together, and maybe the boys would read one paragraph, and the girls would read the other paragraph. That was a reading lesson. For arithmetic, they used a slate. And the slate, they would write their addition problems or their subtraction problems, and they would do their computations using the slate. Penmanship, which is handwriting, cursive writing. They would use a slate where they would practice forming their letters. Now, handwriting was very important in those days. Remember, there was no phones, so you couldn't text your friend or email them if you wanted to invite them over. You would have to write a note, and they would have to write back to you. So it was very important to have good handwriting, especially since everything you did in school was going to be in cursive. So you had to practice, lots of practice of cursive writing. Let's see, history, history. I wonder what president they would be studying in the 1880s. Science, they studied the world around them. And since, in Wilmington, since we're in Wilmington, which is really close to the ocean, they would probably have learned about sea life and the tides and maybe classified shells. And we have elocution. Elocution is the art of speaking clearly and distinctly. And one of the lessons they would probably would have is the following. A big black bug bit a big black bear, and the big black bear bled blood. Now, what do we call this kind of saying? Tongue twister, right. Now, the tongue twisters, are we supposed to say it slowly and deliberately? Fast. So why don't you try it with me? Let's all try it together and let's try to say it faster. Ready? A big black bug bit a big black bear and the big black bear bled blood. Very good. Thank you so much for your attention. And I hope you learned how school of the 1880s was so different, but also very similar to the way school is today. Welcome to the Daily Chores Activity. Many of the modern conveniences we take for granted today were not available in the 1880s. Can you think of some modern conveniences we have today that were not available back then? Things like electric laundry machines, conventional heat and air conditioning, microwaves, electric stove, dishwashers, vacuum cleaners are just a few examples of appliances we have today that were not available 
or were very expensive. Large grocery stores, shopping malls, and airports were not even invented yet. People had to do their chores in order to keep clothes on their back, food on their table, and a warm and comfortable house. Both boys and girls had their share of chores and responsibilities. Churning butter, milking cows, raising chickens, washing laundry, making your own soap and bread, hunting and fishing are just some examples of how family members would spend their day in order to help the household. Children would have to do their chores before and after school. Churning butter was actually how the family would have fresh butter every day. They would milk a cow, bring the milk over to the butter churner, and just churn butter until it was actually solid and they could use it. And that was a long process. It could take over an hour depending on how much butter they needed. How many of you helped do laundry? If you help do laundry, you know it takes over an hour and a half to complete a load of laundry with modern conveniences. Imagine having to wash your clothes by hand though. How much longer do you think that would take? Let's just see how hard or easy it would be to do your clothes in the 1880s by hand. So you have to take a piece of clothes and you want to wet it in soapy water. And the way you get this water soapy is by taking your homemade bar of soap, because you couldn't just go to the grocery store and buy liquid or powder soap. Uh, that didn't exist yet. So what you would do is you would make bar of soap out of lye, and then you would just scrub it on the washboard until you created little suds. And then you take your piece of clothes and you just rub up and down on the washboard. And once you're done scrubbing it, what you want to do is take out some of that water because you're going to come over to the clean water and you're going to rinse it to get all that soap out of there. Now, you either had to squeeze all that water out by yourself or if you were lucky, you had a wringer that would take all the excess water out. And the way you do that is by taking the piece of clothes and putting it between here, but you have to be a little slow, otherwise your fingers will go through. And you just take the handle and you kind of slowly feed it through. And what you'll see in a little bit is the water come out of the bottom of the dress. And then you take some clothespins because you don't have dryers either. And you just put the clothes up in the heat of the day in order to get them to dry. Now, because you have to make your own soap, there's a couple of things you have to consider. Do you want your soap to have a pretty color or do you just want plain soap? So if you want your soap to have color, you would add vegetables that would stain. Things like beets or carrots. If you want your soap to have a nice smell to it, you can add zesty fruit like oranges or lemon or flowers. Think of roses. So when you're doing chores at home, just remember how much easier it is to do chores now than it is 150 years ago where you had to do everything by hand. Hi, I'm Ken, and I'm at the house of Phineas Banning, the Banning House in Wilmington, California. In its day, this area, you couldn't tell by now, but in this area, this was a huge ranch, a farm. They had cows and chickens and pigs and horses. They had horses. In that time frame, they had a lot of blacksmiths working here, and the, the blacksmiths were the mechanics of the day. They were the ones who would fix and repair the wagons and any of the utensils that were broken. They were the mechanics. They would shoe the horses, they would shoe the mules. There were a lot of mules here in those days. So a mule shoe is a little bit longer in shape than a horseshoe. They're a little bit of a different animal, but they get nailed onto the hoof of an animal the same way. And it doesn't hurt the, the animals. When you nail it in, it, it's like your fingernails. So it doesn't hurt when you get your fingernails trimmed. It doesn't hurt these animals when they get the nails put up in there to hold their shoes on. They don't even know it. Some of the things that a blacksmith would have made in those time frames, uh, they certainly would have made knives. Uh, I make some knives, but that's not my favorite thing to do. 
They would have made branding irons. Now this is a B branding iron that I made for the banding house. It would have made a rake for the farmer. This is actually just looks like something with a bunch of nails in it. And then in a little bit, I'll be making some nails to show you how that's done. They would have made handcuffs. Anything that was made out of iron or steel was made by the blacksmith in those days. So this is a blacksmith shop. This would actually be a portable blacksmith shop. Blacksmiths back in the days would, would, would set up a, a, a shop on wheels so that they could take it to their customers. There was also blacksmith shops in the centers of towns, which was the hub of, of a lot of towns because the blacksmith was the, the predominant citizen. He was the one who did everything. Back then, the blacksmiths were the only ones around who could make or fix anything out of iron or steel. They were the only ones who, who had that ability to do things. So in my shop here, I have my anvil. It's my workbench. It's what I hammer on. This is my forge. It's my oven, what I heat my metal up in. We burn coal here. So let's talk about this piece of coal. I grew up in Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania, we have coal mines everywhere. So we mine the coal. We would dig it up out of the ground. Out here in, in Southern California, there are some coal mines, but very, very few. So most of the time, they would be burning charcoal, which is burnt wood. Coal, again, I said it's in mines. It's been in those mines for something like 300 million years. It's buried. It took 300 million years to, to crush this coal into crush the minerals into a piece of coal. I saw Superman take it one time and he just held it in his hand and he crushed it and made a diamond out of it. I tried it and it didn't work. Charcoal burns the same as coal, same heat and everything. It just takes about four times as much to do. I have a bellows. The bellows is my source of air. So there's some holes in the bottom of the bellows that suck air up into this big bag and it pushes that air through this little hose into the fire. That air going into the fire is what gets the fire hot. So if I didn't push air into the fire, the fire wouldn't get hot enough to heat the metal up. The center of the fire is about 2,500 degrees. So it gets pretty hot. When you see me working with the metal, I pull that metal out, it's a bright orange color. That bright orange color is about 1,800 degrees. So it's color or the temperature that we need to move our metal around. So when we're blacksmithing and we work with this metal, we, we get up to that 1800 degree temperature, it behaves like a piece of clay. We can just move it around and we do anything we want with it. One of the things that blacksmiths used to do was make eating utensils, a knife, a fork, a spoon. So when we would make something like this, I would start out with a piece of metal like this. I put a little mark in it here so I could tell this would be the blade and this would be the handle part. Now when I started working on the handle part, I'd put it in the vise and I'd just give it a twist. It's just a piece of clay. I can do anything I want with it. And then when I started working on the blade part, you can see the difference there. I'd hammer it flat and get it drawn out. And when I polished it all up, I had my finished butter knife. So one of the things that a blacksmith did was make nails. So I'm going to make a nail. I'll take a piece of round metal just like this. And when I get done with it, hopefully it'll be a nail. Put it in the fire, get it hot. So when I'm tending this fire, I have to keep pushing air into the fire just to keep it going. Uh, if I didn't push air into the fire, it would go out. Now, back in the day, we had apprentices doing that. The apprentice would be a boy, probably about 10 years old, and he would volunteer his time to learn how to be a blacksmith. But during that time, he was working. He would be the one to tend to the fire. He would be the one in a shop. He would be the one that would build the fire in the morning for the blacksmith before the blacksmith even got in there. He would be sleeping in the blacksmith. That was his home. He may be able to see his family on Sundays, but the rest of the week he was working. He would work the whole day with the blacksmith shop. Uh, he would learn how to, how to hammer the, the nails, how to, how to make things out of metal. Um, it might take him six, seven years to finish his apprenticeship before he could go into what they call the journey ship, journeymanship. The journeymanship would be the next step. So he's, he's, he's graduated into the second grade of a journeyman. And then maybe another five years as a journeyman, he would have to spend before he was qualified to be considered a master blacksmith. So it took a long time to learn that whole process. It wasn't an easy task. And I don't have an apprentice, so I have to make, keep my fire going here. Now back in the old days, Girls weren't allowed to be apprentices. They were not even considered to be an apprentice. It was only, uh, only offered to the boys. In today's world, girls can do anything. 
Uh, I know some, some, some of the best blacksmiths I know today are women who can out hammer me. So uh, things have changed. Things have changed a lot. So that's about 1800 degrees. I'm just going to draw it out to a point. I'll have to go back in and get a little bit more heat. See how long we're going to make this nail. Something like that. So I'll mark it. I need more heat. bend it where I put that mark. And there's my nail. To get it hot again. And we're gonna break it off where I put that mark. So there's my nail, but we need to put a top on it. Pull it down. That's my nail. So let's talk about these nails that I just made. It, it took me, what, three, four minutes to make a nail. Can you imagine how long it would take to make enough nails to build a house? Back in those days, there was no Lowe's or Home Depot to shop in. If you wanted something made, you had to go to the blacksmith shop, ask him to make it for you, and if he had time, he could do it. Who knows how long it would take him to do that, but you couldn't just go in there and buy things off the shelf, is what I'm trying to get to. Everything was handmade, custom made, and it all took a lot of time. Thank you for participating in Banning Heritage Virtual Field Trip. I hope you found some of this information interesting and that it inspires you to learn more about our local history here in Wilmington and in Southern California. I look forward to a day when we can all be here together in person, but in the meantime, please stay safe and take care. Goodbye.